Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. If you had to get the perfect person to interview Tom Brokaw, you would reach out to the historian and scholar Mary Elise Cerati. Fortunately, we did not have to reach too far since Dr. Cerati is a visiting professor of government and history here at Harvard. She is also the Dean's Professor of History at the University of Southern California, a prolific author, scholar of 20th century history, as well as an experienced journalist. Her 2009 book, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe, was the Financial Times Book of the Year and won prizes for distinguished scholarship on both US and communist bloc foreign policy. Professor Cerati's recent book, the Collapse, the Accidental Opening of the Berlin Wall has been widely hailed for its scholarship. Professor Cerati worked in Europe as a journalist for Time Magazine, The Economist, and as an analyst for both CNN and Sky Television. And perhaps most important, she earned her bachelor's degree here at Harvard, and she wrote for the Crimson. <laughs> we are honored and delighted to have her here. Dr. Cerati. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And I am very grateful to the Kennedy School and to the forum for giving me the opportunity to once again talk to this gentleman, Tom Brokaw. He was very generous with his time when I was writing my book, The Collapse, The Accidental Opening of the Berlin Wall. And the interviews that I did with him were so amazing, I thought it's a shame I'm the only one doing them. It would be great if we could recreate them with more people here. So thank you for making the time to do this. Uh, I feel a little redundant introducing one of the most famous men in the world, but Tom Brokaw is a distinguished journalist. He spent his entire career with NBC News, most notably as anchor of NBC Nightly News. In his long career, starting in the 1960s, he covered multiple major world events, including, as we're going to hear tonight, the opening of the Berlin Wall. He was the only journalist, American, German, British, uh, Martian to guess right, uh, to go all in and actually set up a television broadcast platform and basically stake out the wall. Uh, this was a combination of luck and planning and it paid off spectacularly on the night of November 9th and I'm pleased that NBC will also allow us to show a little bit of a clip from that evening later tonight. Uh, in 2008, he took over Meet the Press when his close friend and colleague uh, Tim Russert died. He also is a, an author. Uh, his book, The Greatest Generation, is one of the best-selling nonfiction books of the 20th century. He is the author of five other books, including most recently, The Time of Our Lives. And he has won uh, practically every major award in his field, Peabody, DuPont, Emmy, and I hear there are more awards to come in the near future as well. So thank you very much for taking the time to thank be here you. with us thank tonight. You thank much. you. So perhaps we could uh, set the stage a little bit with the late Cold War. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev has come to office. I believe you're one of the first people to interview him. Uh, President Reagan has uh, spoken in Berlin, has asked um, tear down this wall in June of 1987. Perhaps you could take us back to that time at the end of the 1980s. Well, it's hard now to uh, let a, a new generation know how um, both a, a exciting it was and how uncertain it was when Gorbachev arrived on the scene. Before that, we had been dealing uh, during the Cold War with all these men in cardboard suits that you would see primarily on May Day standing atop Lenin's tomb and reviewing all the hardware in the world, knowing that both sides had enough nuclear capability to wipe out life on Earth as we knew it. Uh, when Richard Nixon took office, there was a new attempt to create a new kind of relationship. And going to Moscow as a reporter and then going all across the country as I did, I'm a kind of an adventurer. I kayaked through the Russian Far East and fished in the Northwest as well. You wondered how long the system could be sustained, but they had such enormous control over every aspect of the lives of people that I think that it's fair to say my generation uh, of Soviet scholars thought it would probably go into the 21st century. A little backdrop, I was a political science major and uh, I was a child of the Cold War. This was a big part of my life growing up. Uh, 
you know, I was one of those kids who dove under a desk during the air raid drills and, and that kind of thing and paid a lot of attention to it and thought it would be part of my life. Suddenly, Mikhail Gorbachev arrives on the scene. He is much more modern in his appearance and in his language and in his thinking than anybody we'd ever seen. I went out to the airport when he arrived in Geneva to have his first meeting with Ronald Reagan. I wanted to see him away from the crowds. Stepped off the airplane, he had a modern looking fedora on. His wife was extremely well groomed and dressed and was with him. We had not seen that before. And he stepped up to the microphone and pulled out a handkerchief and patted his lip before he stepped forward. That was the kind of behavior that you, you know, it was a little bit of a signal about this is a different kind of guy. And then we began to watch him as he moved across the country talking about glasnost and perestroika. I remember when he was in Vladivostok, which is in the Russian Far East, as you know, and is an important military port. And right behind him was a, was, a, uh, was a Russian general who had the most bewildered look in his eyes as Gorbachev was talking about what his plans were for changing the Soviet Union. He came to this country. Uh, he was a rock star on the streets of Washington, D.C. So there was a vibrancy about what was going on there, but we didn't know how it was going to end up. At the same time, you had a new generation of protesters, like for once in Poland, uh, Vaclav Havel in Czechoslovakia, and others who were pushing from the bottom up for reforms and changes. So something was going on, but how it would play out, we couldn't say at that point. Uh, it, was, it was delicate and tentative, and the stakes were huge. So that kind of sets the scene for where we were. And we did know that Gorbachev was a different cat running, the, running Russia and running the Soviet Union. I later talked to uh, one of his closest young advisors, who will have to go nameless for purposes of this discussion, and I said to him, when did you know? And he said, I knew when the Koreans came to Moscow. They had been a primitive agrarian society in 1953, and suddenly they arrived with all the electronics and all the new automobiles, and with the, the idea that they're gonna take on capitalism around the world, and we were stuck in low gear. And he said, that's when I knew. And I think that, that there was that discussion going on among the intelligentsia in Russia that cannot be sustained in some way. Um, and then, as you know, leading up to the Berlin Wall, the protests became more vigorous, uh, Valencia was speaking out. The Pope was not an incidental figure, by the way, in keeping the lid on in Poland. Uh, so as a journalist, uh, it was a very exciting time. 1989 was one of those years that will live, in my judgment, in bold print in the front of chapters in history books. Uh, it, it was a transformation of the world. You were also in China in 1989 as well. It was. Where the uh, mood was much less hopeful. I went because Gorbachev went. He was moving around the world and he went to China and the, the urban, urbane students from the university in China saw him as a symbol of what they wanted to have in their country. And so they were gathering in Tiananmen Square during his visit and then he left and they didn't leave the square. And the question was, what would happen to them. I came back at that point, because we thought this, we never anticipated that it would end the way that it did, but it did become uh, much more of a challenge to the, to the Chinese leaders. And so the crackdown happened on that weekend. And um, we, we still had crews there, obviously, and everything. We still don't know what the death toll was, but it was a lot larger than what the Chinese government would say. So I jumped on a plane on that weekend, made my way to Tokyo, could not get into China, um, but there was a very hopeful agent from Pan Am for the younger people here. That used to be an airline in America, by the way. Uh, and I, I made a call in the middle of the night to Jim Baker, who was Secretary of State, saying, I, want, I know you've got a plane going in to resupply our embassy. And he said, you're not going to be on it, Brokaw. This is, I'm not going to get a journalist on our plane. And the Pan Am agent said, I think there's a British embassy plane going. I think I can sneak you on that. We'll have to decide what we're going to call you, uh, you know, some kind of an aid worker. So I went in as an aid worker to China. And I'd been in Beijing many times before that and across the country. And when I stepped off the plane, it was the most eerie experience that one of the largest uh, robust cities in the world was eerily quiet, deathly quiet. And I made my way to what passed for our offices down near Tiananmen Square. And our, our, my colleagues were effectively locked in their offices. And the whole square was ringed by the militia. Most of them had come from the country. And even though they were generationally aligned with the protesters, they didn't feel connected to them because these were university students and, and, the, and the conscripts were from poor peasant villages. And it was tough. And then within 24 hours, one of my very favorite 
colleagues was a cameraman from South America, from South Africa that I'd worked with all over the world in all the wars. And I came down one morning and he, he said, he had a big bushy beard and bush shorts and he said, mate, I think we can make some pictures. And he was putting a box on the back of a flying pigeon, which was their flying, which was their pedestrian bicycle that they all had in those days. It's before they got in Lamborghinis and Porsches, which they now have. And he said, we'll put a camera in here, we'll cut a little hole, you get on a bicycle behind me and we'll ride through Tiananmen Square and we'll show the folks back home what's going on. We did that successfully for two days. The first video that came out of China was ours and I was able to talk about the, uh, the eerie calm and the, and the sense of foreboding that the people had that we would encounter in the back alleys and so on. So that was going on in 1989 as well. Did you worry that that kind of violence might take place in Cold War Europe as well? And I'm putting up an image here. The uh, orange color shows the Soviet bloc or Warsaw Pact, and the green color shows NATO. And you'll notice the dividing line runs right through Germany, divided into East and West Germany. Did you worry that those reforms in Poland, that those, they well, might encounter you know, violent resistance? Yeah, we didn't know. I, I think a couple of things. I, I thought that Gorbachev would not go to DEFCON 1. I, I thought that he had a different attitude about what was going to be necessary. I think he knew he was playing a losing hand at that point. Mm -hmm. And if you go forward to Helsinki and, 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 and then when they had meetings there, and then especially in Reykjavik in Iceland, he knew the game was up for him. He, he couldn't deal with SDI, and he was trying desperately to get an elimination of all the nuclear weapons because then it would give parity to them. And if you look at the accounts of that meeting, you know, they were very chummy when they came out at lunchtime, uh, President Reagan and Gorbachev. And by late afternoon, when Gorbachev laid out what his hopes were, I had covered Reagan since 1966, and he was furious. I mean, his lips were pursed, and I thought, there's no deal here. And Gorbachev went back knowing that they didn't have a deal, and they didn't have a lot of places to go at that point. Was it going to become violent? Uh, I thought the chances of violence were greater from the smaller officials, the uh, nomenclatura who were running places like East Germany and, and parts of Czechoslovakia and so on, they were not getting very much instruction. And would they revert to what had always been the way that they would deal with any kind of an uprising, which would be with force. But they also knew that their future depended on this. When the Velvet Revolution ended after two weeks in Czechoslovakia, I went to the to the regional headquarters of the Communist Party, and, and it was uh, completely different than the rest of Prague. It was beautifully pine paneled offices and the elevators and the, all the food and drink you can imagine, and guys who were really thuggy, who were guarding every door. And I got to the top floor, and there was a guy about my age who was obviously very bright, and I said, what's your future? And he said, I I'm really more worried about my mother. He said, she's on a pension here. He said, look, I made a choice to join the Communist Party because it was the only choice I had. I'm an engineer. I wanted to work. This is what I was going to do. And he said, this is going to be good for Czechoslovakia in the long run. I don't know what happens to me. And he said, that ultimately, that's not important. There were those kind of people hmm. through the system as well. Hmm. Did you uh, spend much time in Poland with Solidarity, like Valencia as well? I did. I was, I was there three times, I think. We first saw uh, the once on a presidential visit. I was back when the Pope arrived. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always felt that the Holy Father was an important figure because there was, a, there was a real movement from the ground up among young people that they wanted to take on uh, the Soviet Union. And, uh, there was a, and within that movement, they thought that the, um, that the cardinal who was in charge of Poland was a quisling. But in fact, he was a messenger from Pope, Paul, Pope John Paul, and he, he really carried the message to him about keep the lid on. And the Pope, the Holy Father, went to Valencia and said, we learned later, and said, you know, you're playing with fire here. You know, you've got to give it time and let it play out. So those kinds of things were going on behind the scenes that we didn't always see. Mm -hmm. I, I do remember saying to some of my colleagues who were kind of with solidarity with the, uh, with the younger people in Poland, I said, you know, these are big stakes. And we have to be careful about what we don't know. I went down to hear uh, the Pope preach at uh, uh, a coal mining town, Katowice. Mm -hmm. And I stood behind a coal miner and his son. The coal miner had very thick shoulders and a thick neck. And I know he only had one suit he was wearing at that day. And he was holding his son's hand. And I thought, that's Poland. And 
he's not going to risk his son's life to go confront what's going on. There's got to be a better way of dealing with this. Mm -hmm. It was fine for the university students and the urban people to say that, but out in the countryside, mm -hmm. what they wanted to do was have a life and have another generation have a life. Mm -hmm. But for once it was, he was an authentically charismatic figure. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just, he just oozed charisma. I was with him at a Nobel uh, laureates conference in South Africa a couple of years ago, and he got into it with Gorbachev. Gorbachev wanted to create a, uh, an Eastern Bloc uh, answer to NATO, mm -hmm. and he said the Russians should run it. He said, that's what you always think. He said, we had you running it for a while. We don't want to have that happen again. <laughs> and uh, he, he was about as good an intuitive politician as I've ever encountered. Interesting. So of course, the example of solidarity had an impact on East Germany. I'm putting up an image now, not of Berlin, but of the city of Leipzig on the night of October 9th, 1989, uh, an important night when the regime had to retreat in the face of at least 100,000 protesters on the street. And I think this is the point at which you start covering Germany very closely, and then you, of course, are in East Berlin for the infamous Politburo press conference, and you have an exclusive interview with the member of the Politburo, Gunter Schabowski. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about the press conference, and then we'll show the clip of your interview. Okay. Well, I just want to say about that, yeah. Leipzig, and the other piece of it was that they were going out of, uh, of the GDR to Czechoslovakia, and they right. were effectively right. overrunning Czechoslovakia. The pressure right. was enormous. And that's when one of my colleagues said to me, it was our foreign editor on a morning, I was in there and there was not much going on in this country. He said, why don't you go to Berlin? He said, there's not much happening here. He said, it's, you know, a lot of things are percolating over there. Do a couple of days and we'll see how it works out. We had no idea that the wall would come down on my watch. And then at that time you had a pre-order of satellite. Now you just kind of carry it with you. And so he made all those arrangements and I went to Berlin and I was able to get into the East easily for the first time. I was meeting dissidents. They were uh, obviously confined to the East. Um, and they were talking about their hopes, but they were long-range hopes at that point. And then on the second day, I called New York and said, you know, we're not going to need the satellite. We don't have a story that really uh, is of such magnitude that we ought to spend all that money. I'll just do some reports and we'll tape them from here. And I went to this news conference with a propaganda chief from the GDR, and I was, everybody in there was about half asleep by after about an hour. He droned on and typically bureaucratic ways, and then he pulled out this piece of paper which said, in effect, uh, that all residents of the GDR can leave uh, East Germany through any opening in the wall. And it was clear, almost in, in retrospect, that he really didn't know what he was talking about. He got kind of, not panicked, but he got concerned after he'd read it about, have I gone too far here? One of my colleagues, Michelle Newbert, had arranged an interview with me well in advance with him, well in advance, so I rushed upstairs the rest of the press conference, all the attendees were confused. They, we thought the wall was down, but we couldn't be clear. And I interviewed him. Are we going to show that interview? Yes. Yeah. Martin, could we show the clip of the interview with the Politburo member? Mr. Chabosky, do I understand it correctly? Citizens of the GDR can leave through any checkpoint that they choose for personal reasons. They no longer have to go through a third country. Uh, they are not further forced to leave GDR by uh, uh, transit uh, through another country. It is possible for them to go through the wall at some point, presumably. It is possible for them to go through the border. Freedom to travel. Yes, of course. It is no question of tourism. It is the permission of leaving GDR. So what did you think? He didn't have a, he didn't have a, he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. Really what I thought. <laughs> he, he, uh, he, he was a low-level bureaucrat who had risen to a position, as a lot of people forget in the Politburo at that point, was run by second and third rate people in the, in the East. And as you write, uh, you know, so wonderfully, is that he left that news conference, went home to the compound where they all lived and they were all asleep. They'd gone to bed not thinking anything had changed. The fact is that they were supposed to have, they had all these stipulations about how you could leave. You would have to get a visa and you would have to come back. He told me a year later that they believed in their naivete that the East Germans would go out into West Berlin and then come right back and resume their old lives. And, and that's, that's, how, that's how disoriented they were. And, uh, how, and so I ran down after that news conference, there was a nod of my fellow journalists who were 
mostly foreign correspondents, and I said to him, it's true, the wall is down. Raced out to Checkpoint Charlie to get back into the western side, and they would always give us a bad time at the checkpoints, and the guard just waved us through, and I said, wait a minute, get out. And I said, did you watch on television? This played out across East Berlin. And he said, I do, I did, we threw the interpreter, and I said, what did you think? And he looked at me and he said, I'm not paid to think. So <laughs> we, we kept on going, and, uh, and I went back, and I was on a, we didn't have mobile phones in those days, we had car phones. And I called New York, and by then they'd been alerted, and I went on the air, and kept going on the air, and then went back to the office to prepare everything, and then we ended up at Brandenburg Gate that night. Yeah, yeah. That's how it was. Um, we also, thanks to NBC, have a clip from Brandenburg Gate that night, so we'll show you that clip as well. Pay attention not only to Mr. Broca in the foreground, but also to what is happening behind him, uh, what is going on on the wall behind him. So Martin, if we could play the clip of the Brandenburg Gate. A historic moment tonight. The Berlin Wall can no longer contain the East German people. Thousands pouring across at the Bornholmer Bridge. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. What you see behind me is a celebration of this new policy announced today by the East German government that now, for the first time since the wall was erected in 1961, people will be able to move through freely. This crowd has gathered here tonight spontaneously. From the East German side, they have been training water cannon, as you can see on some of the celebrants, but it doesn't seem to make much difference. We'll show you some videotape now as well of what happened earlier tonight when there were even more people atop the wall. The West German police have moved in here, suggesting that they move back, saying that the situation is already complicated enough, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. The people are here to celebrate freedom. For the East Germans, freedom to travel, a primary right for people anywhere in the world. The East German government said today that the East Germans can now go for a short visit or go to the West permanently as they go through the Berlin Wall at any number of the checkpoints. The East German government announced all of this to demonstrate to the world and to its own people, of course, that it is serious about reform. The wall, as we have known it since 1961, a sinister symbol of oppression, the wall has changed dramatically tonight. <laughs> there, there are a couple of things worth noting about that. Uh, I was, uh, first of all, people often say to me, what do you think when you watch that coverage? And I say, I think I wish I were still that age. One of the <laughs> Uh, and I'm in a very handsome blue top coat. And I, I had gone over there with one of my typical kind of ratty outdoor coats that I'd used. That one I think I'd climb Mount Katahdin in, in fact. And I, I thought, this is going to be on television forever, on videotape. So one of my colleagues had just come from London, and he had a beautiful blue cashmere top coat. I am wearing it. I said, I'm, give me that top coat. I'm going to put that on. Uh, and then at, back in New York, the control room, we have everything scripted. And I said, I can't deal with the script here. I'm just going to have to add a little bit. It's such chaos. We didn't have any teleprompter or anything like that. And I, whatever reputation I have centers sometimes on my ability to stand and talk. I have kind of a teleprompter of the mind. So I was just <laughs> working my way through it all. And it was one of those occasions in which I, I was glad that I'd been a journalist as long as I had been and grown up the way that I did because I was familiar with, with most of the issues. And there was a guy standing over in the wall, we've talked about this before, who who resisted all the water cannon. He had a leather jacket on, and he was laughing, and everybody was cheering him on. He'd come from the West, and they couldn't drive him off the wall. So I sent one of my colleagues over to get him to say this is the symbol of the new era of freedom. And my colleague came back, said, not what we think. He said he's a drunk who's been living over here in the forest, and he hasn't had a shower in two weeks. He's very happy about <laughs> where he is. I mean, what did you think? You're, you're, you're there, and you're, uh, it, it seems that the regime has said that people can move freely across the wall, and yet behind you, there's water cannons spraying with such force they're almost hitting you. Well, they were worried about that in New York, that I would get washed off the platform. Right. <laughs> Apparently, they had Garrick Utley on yep. standby on a minute's notice for when you were knocked off the platform by the water cannon. Right. They yeah. were going to go live to him in New York. <laughs> well, one of the things I thought was, and I, because my mind was working on two tracks, Will the Russians respond? Will they mm -hmm. send tanks? Yeah. Will they try to shut this down? Yeah. And what will be the short and long-term consequences of all of this? Yeah. Will they change in East Germany? And will the country be united? I was thinking about that that night. Because 
you know, we were playing in an entirely new universe here. There was no way of, there were no predictors that would tell us what would happen. But as the people poured across, and a lot of it was generational, we were younger people who said, we're not gonna live this way. Their parents had gone through the agony, all self-induced of World War II, and the Germans had gone through the 20th century with these self-induced wounds that they had inflicted on the world, and their parents were beaten down. But this new generation said, we're not gonna accept this. And so they were the young people at Leipzig and, and, and going off to Czechoslovakia. And then when they poured through, it was like watching creatures of the moon arriving on Earth. They would come into West Berlin, they would have these uh, acid-washed jeans and very poor prams and the Lada and the Trabant two-cycle uh, cars belching diesel smoke. And they would drive and walk down the Kafirstendam with all these fantastic Western stores uh, filled with goods, and they just couldn't imagine what they were seeing. There were some very touching stories. There was a tailor who lived, you know, 40 meters from the wall, and every morning he would get up and he could see another person on the other side of the wall in an East German apartment, and they would wave to each other. And they had been doing that for 25 years. And then they were able to be united and, and get to know who they were, uh, each other. So it was a very, very important, also a very, very human moment when that yeah. happened. Yeah. I also, uh, thanks to Mr. Broca, I had the good fortune to interview a number of the members of his production team who helped to make that broadcast possible. And they described to me their main experience of that night, which was panic, because the press conference happened that it <laughs> concluded at about 7 p.m. local time, and that Gunter Schabowski, the man you saw, seemed to say the wall was open. It, it wasn't, but he, he seemed to imply that. And so you used a car phone to call that in at about seven o'clock German time or one o'clock New York time. It then became the responsibility of your team to get photos of people crossing the wall, which didn't exist. <laughs> it took a while. There was such confusion on the east. And we made all these promises and it was, the clock was ticking down to 6.30 hour time. We still didn't have people coming through the wall. Right. And, uh, <laughs> And we kept saying, it's going to happen, don't worry about it. And, we're, and uh, the whole team, we had camera crews up and down the wall. And a, a very enterprising cameraman, Pete from uh, London, ran across half the city to get to us because he'd been at Alberta Bridge and, um, and he had the footage. And yeah. uh, that's what you saw when they were pouring through. And you've done this uh, astonishingly effective job of describing what the guard was going through at that bridge. He, at one point, they thought about shooting him. Uh, and he was asking his superiors for some advice on what to do, and he was getting no help. So this is the man who opens the Berlin Wall. His name is Harold Jaeger. He was a Stasi officer, an East German secret police officer, and he was on duty at the Bornholmer Street checkpoint, where one of your intrepid team members finally showed up and, and got some footage. And he uh, was on the job that night, as he had been every night for the past 25 years. He'd worked at this border crossing for 25 years, and basically nothing unusual had ever happened. And suddenly it's the night of November 9th, and hundreds and then thousands of people are showing up and saying, I just heard a press conference, and it sounds like I can cross through the wall. And he called his superior officers and said, have I got any new instructions? And they said, no, business as usual. Nothing has changed. Keep the gates closed. And he called again and said, I, I've got more people here. And they said, business as usual. Keep the gates closed. He said that he called his superior officers 30 times over the course of four hours. And at some point, he just realized that he was completely being left in the lurch. And he felt uh, scared. He felt that he'd been left alone. He was actually going through a cancer scare on top of everything else. It turned out he didn't have cancer, but he had had tests to see if he had cancer, and he actually had a doctor appointment the next day to get the results. And so that night, he thought, I'm a dead man anyway. And at, at a key moment, finally, at about 11.30 p.m. on November 9th, he, he looked at his men at the border crossing and said, either we're going to shoot all these people or we're going to open up because this mob is gonna overrun us, our superiors are no good, I can't get any instructions, the, the, the ship of state is sinking, I'm dying of cancer anyway. Either we're gonna shoot all these people or we're gonna open up. And so Harold Yeager makes the decision to open up and this is the result of his decision. This is the opening of the Berlin Wall at about 11.30 p.m. on the night of November 9th. And fortunately, you can see there's a man there uh, standing and filming. That's not actually one of your team members, as far as I know. But fortunately, one of your team members was there and was actually able to, to film this. Right. 
And so then uh, I understand from one of your producers that he just, in a, in a dead run, just barely got it to your producer in time for airtime at 6.30 p.m. New York time. He did. Um, <laughs> uh, he was, a, he was a, you know, we're a kind of band of brothers type when we go on these assignments. We've been all over the world together, and we know who we can count on. And Pete was a guy that, you know, was a, a tiny little guy, but he was fearless, and, uh, and he had a lot of energy, thank God. And he got it to us like, like four or five minutes before we went on the air. So we were able to open with those dramatic scenes that you saw before we rode, rolled the billboard of uh, NBC Nightly News. The other st story about people in the GDR at that time, I'd been dealing with the dissonance, and one of the dissonance was it had a theater arts group, and he was a kind of to the barricades type until the reality of his changed life set in on him. And I went back to see him five days later, and he wanted money for the interview. He was in a panic because he'd been subsidized by the East German government. And they realized their lives had been changed, for most of them, much for the better. But for him, the economic underpinning, however modest it was, had been pulled out from under him. And uh, there was a lot of confusion on that side. And it took a while, by the way. You know, This is, was not instant democracy on the, on the Eastern side. Uh, there was questions about whether we're going to have NATO troops there for a while, and uh, Margaret Thatcher was uh, vigorously opposed to the idea of reunification at that point and how they were going to put it together. Helmut Kohl was out of the city when it happened. He came back and he went into the town square at, at City Hall and he asked the crowd to join him in singing Uber Alles, and Berliners being Berliners booed him, and he was in a rage. So there were, there were divided feelings within Germany about whether this was going to be good for the Germans in the long haul. The German national anthem is the same music as Deutschland über alles, but they've changed the words. Right. But uh, that still didn't go over well with West no, Berliners no, it didn't. Who, who booed him. So you then were at the Brandenburg Gate uh, basically through the night. You had to, every time a new time zone uh, hit 630, you, you started rebroadcasting, right? right? And then we did a special report. And then you did a special report. Uh, one person who was not watching, I believe, was your wife. Yeah, I know. She's going to be embarrassed. I'm going to tell the story. My, we, were, we, had, we were doing some work in our apartment in New York, so we had rented a, a, a kind of a, a, a temporary place on the west side. And Meredith had gone, I think, to the theater then. I'm not sure. Came home, walked our dog, and then went to bed, didn't watch television. <laughs> had no idea what I was doing and where I was. I mean, she knew I was in Germany. <laughs> So she gets up in the morning to walk the dog again, and she's out in Central Park, and people are coming up to her that she knows. Tears, she says, you could not be more proud of him. I mean, it was the most moving thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and she's saying, oh, I feel the same way. I think, what in the world is going on? <laughs> I went home, turned on television, and saw what I'd done. And so I finally got a call through to her, and I said, my God, honey. And she said, I have a, I have a confession to make. I didn't see any of it. <laughs> It's actually part of the glue that keeps our marriage together. <laughs> you know, it's the kind of thing where she has her life and I have ours and we know how to, you know, when we need to convene. But it's, it's, it's been a running <laughs> joke in the family for a long time. <laughs> so you had a long night broadcasting in front of the gate. Your camera is also caught, which is very useful to me in my research, signs of the East German security forces resealing the gate. They actually managed to, this picture you see here actually disappears. They're able to clear off the gate. And the security forces, the East German secret police, reseals the gate by about four in the morning. And you caught a lot of that on camera. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, what was going through your head? You just. Well, that was again about uh, the uncertain future. Yeah. Uh, we just didn't know what would happen. Yeah. And was, and we know that later that Gorbachev was on the phone a lot saying, don't let this get completely out of control. Yeah. But he was not going to send the tanks or troops to do it. Uh, there are a couple of figures that we're now very familiar with who had a role in that night. One is Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, yeah. arguably the most powerful woman in the world. She was a laboratory technician in the East and walked across that night with her sister. Mm -hmm. So think of the transformation. And this, by the way, is throughout the German system now. Wherever I go, the embassy or in the government offices, I ask people, where were you? And uh, so many of them were uh, East German students. They listened to it on radio or they were there that night and now they're the director of information at the embassy in Washington or their professors or their in think tanks throughout Germany and they have closed ranks. The other thing is that I was, uh, uh, 10 years after unification, I was at a conference in Atlanta with Helmut Kohl, Mikhail Gorbachev, and George Bush 41. And Helmut Kohl, not a very demonstrative man, we started the uh, discussion in front of Brent Scowcroft and Jim Baker and other people who were in on the decision making and a lot of other interest. And Cole got very emotional at the podium, and he turned to 
Gorbachev, and he said, you did not send the tanks, and I'll be forever grateful for that. And he turned to Bush, and he said, and you immediately said that we ought to be a unified country, and I'll be very grateful for that. So there was, it was high drama, and the stakes were very, very big, obviously. They didn't play out perfectly, as we now know, but it was, a, it was one of those moments in history in which the world overnight changed uh, in terms of the power structure and the futures of those people that were coming across the wall and how we were going to put the West back together again to deal with a new reality of what's going on in the Soviet Union. And Gorbachev, for his part, had some difficult decisions to make. I just pulled up something I wrote in 1991 in the New York Times because I got very close to the Gorbachev inner circle after I uh, did that first interview with him. And I was over there, and Yakovlev, who was kind of his uh, intellectual guru, and Shevardnadze, who was his foreign minister, took me aside and they said, we want to have a snap election to get a, a certification of Gorbachev as the leader of the country, but he's resisting because he was determined to have at least a dotted line to keep the Soviet uh, satellites connected, and he didn't want to give up on communism. And they were very unhappy with him about that. So I wrote this piece about this is what they're thinking in his inner circle. And two weeks later, he was arrested. And uh, he was taken to the Crimea and put under house arrest. And that's when Yeltsin came in and became the new popular figure of Germany. The other figure that was watching that night was a KB, KGB agent by the name of Putin, who was a Russian nationalist. And he wept all night long because of what had happened to the Soviet Union and the loss of control of the GDR. So great events have smaller players, and they have, as well, uh, real consequences eventually. So uh, I'm going to ask one more question, but then we're going to move to your questions. If you would please line up at the microphones, and I'll just alternate between the microphones. Uh, and when you ask your question, you could please identify yourself and, and keep it brief so people act, more people have a chance to ask questions. So please feel free to start lining up at the microphones if you'd like to ask a question. But I have one final question for you, which is uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and the 25th anniversary celebrations and the fall of the wall in Berlin has started to talk about a potential new Cold War. And as someone who spent so much of his professional life engaging with the old Cold War, do you, do you feel like you're seeing familiar trends reemerging? Well, I, um, I'm not an admirer of Putin. Uh, I've dealt with him. I think I had the first interview, maybe the only interview that he's on on American television. And then I had a dinner for him in New York and brought in a lot of my journalistic colleagues who had spent time there. When uh, was that? Pardon me? When did you do this interview with Putin? I did it about a year after he took office. And, um, and it was a long, uh, contentious dinner. Uh, it was David Remnick from The New Yorker and Kaiser from The Washington Post. Uh, and, and then Marina Orth, just, it was Tim Russert's widow now, but she'd just been over there doing a thing about corruption in the banking system, and he didn't give an inch. He was, he was not, he was, there was no attempt on his part to win us over with his personality. I mean, he was dug in, and it was the kind of a uh, KGB-like exchange that we were having, and uh, nobody's ever been able to get back to him since then uh, to get him to talk about anything. When I interviewed him in Moscow, it was the same thing. I mean, he just was not going to give up on anything on his very strong, in my judgment, narrowly cast nationalist view about resurrecting the place of Mother Russia in world affairs. You know, it's an enormous country, great resources. Uh, it's got a big military. And now you've got a guy who looks at the rest of the world and said, there are opportunities for me to restore what I believe is the Russian greatness. I do think that the West fumbled some opportunities. I thought right after the wall came down and we began to expand NATO looking toward Russia and moving toward Russia, that there were other ways that, uh, that I think that we could have handled that. And in, it, to, in my judgment, at least, NATO had been such a critical component in dealing with the Cold War. And we allowed it to kind of, if not come apart, to be fractured a little bit. The individual countries started going in their own direction. And we're paying a price for that right now. And uh, I don't know where he ends up, Putin, but there's no question in my mind that he has an enormous appetite for restoring what he believes is Russian nationalism and greatness on the world stage. Okay. That's good. All right, sir, if you could please um, identify yourself and um, ask a brief question, that would be fantastic. Yeah, my, na my name is Steve Vincent, and I'm married to a Russian. Um, I'm 
interested in the comments you made about how Gorbachev uh, had limited options and that there was a lot going on behind his decisions with uh, Glasnost and Perestroika. I'd be curious if you could elaborate a little bit more about what was controlling uh, his decisions and whether there are any parallels that we might see in Russia today. Well, wh one of the things that was happening, in, in fact, by 91, 90, 91, they had bad, they had bad crop failures. So they had real issues going on in the economy. And, uh, you know, in the old days that they would just uh, inflate the numbers and people would have to do with what they had. But he'd open up the system so people could comment on it. And he was trying to change it at that point. I, I really think that he was university educated. Raisa, his wife, was an enormous influence on him. She was very smart. And she was the first Russian leader's wife that we saw appearing with him, but it went well beyond that. After he'd been arrested in the Crimea, and he was kind of a no man's land, he came to New York, and he asked me, uh, we wanted to have him to our house for dinner, and then uh, it was from a security point of view, that was not possible. So he said, would come to the Waldorf and bring some friends that I should meet. So I cobbled together a kind of representative group of Americans. I have a friend who's a Western writer by the name of Tom McGuane. He flew in for it. And Charlene Hunter Galt was a prominent journalist on PBS at the time. We got her to come. And um, uh, we got other Russian experts to come as well. There were about a half a dozen of us all together, maybe. And she was side by side with him in her analysis of what Russia needed to do. And it was clear to me. That, uh, that they were a match pair in terms of understanding what the long-term problems of Russia were and how they were going to have to deal with them, pushing up against not just the establishment of the Communist Party, but the population that had gotten used to subsidies and having a house and, you know, and, and not having to worry about earning any of it. And you know, there was a lot of excitement at the beginning about Glasnost and Perestroika until the reality set in. Uh, in the early days, there, you, know, you could see what was what's happened now coming. I, there was a Georgian that I met before. Uh, they went to the free economy. And we tapped into him. He had warehouses full of computers and Western uh, washing machines. And I said, how do you do this? He said, I give computer lessons to the children of the Politburo. <laughs> he said, I have a school. And he said, they let me do whatever I want. So I'm shipping in everything from uh, West Germany. And there was, it was unbelievably naive about how a free economy works. But those who did know how it worked made a lot of money and continue to. Sir, if you could identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm an alumnus at Harvard. And um, the Berlin Wall has become a very iconic uh, object itself. And I was wondering if you could walk back and, and comment a little bit on what you saw when ordinary people began to chip away at the wall itself. And then if you could also reflect on what you think the wall means today, because it's literally pieces of the wall are around the world as kind of iconic symbols. So if you could just comment on what you observed and then what the wall means today uh, to you. Yeah, well, you know, I, that had not occurred to me that they would start chipping away at it, by the way, and start trying to take it down right in front of us. And I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day. We had a wonderful computer technician by the name of Eddie Lee, who was kind of a, he had an enormous amount of energy, and his, his duties were over for the evening where everything was working well. And I turned around at one point, I don't remember where we were in the broadcast, and he said, your piece of the wall. And he had an enormous chunk of the wall that he handed to me. And then when it caught on, everybody was after it. Uh, so I came back with uh, very heavy suitcases loaded with chunks of the wall. <laughs> and they made wonderful Christmas presents and little boxes that I did. <laughs> and, 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 I, and, uh, and, and then I had them encased as well and sent them around. So I still have them. And uh, there's a wonderful, if you get to Washington, D.C., the museum has a wonderful display of the wall. They have a piece of the wall itself, and then what we did there that night. But again, it's important for you to understand, we didn't know where this was going to go. We didn't know that, that Germany could be united at that point. I really did think that there might be military action of some kind, and that maybe the East German government and Gorbachev himself would resist the idea of unification. There was a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes that we learned about later. Baker went to Gorbachev and he said, would you rather have Germany, a united Germany outside NATO or a united Germany inside NATO? Now the Russians had had a terrible, terrible, costly experience with a united Germany in World War II and he said, we'd rather have them 
in NATO than outside of NATO. So there were all these uh, things that were going on. The one missed opportunity in my judgment was I thought that I thought that George Bush 41 did a, 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 an astonishingly effective job of managing all of that. Uh, he was a man who'd gone to World War II and he'd grown up, he'd been in the UN, UN ambassador, director of the CIA. But given his uh, reticence to put himself out front, I thought that night was an opportunity for him to make a measured statesmanlike speech about the new era that we're in. He didn't want to make it harder on, on Gorbachev than it already was. I understand that. But he could have made a statement to America and to the rest of the world about we're now a much, we have, we have a much larger universe of free people and that we all have obligations to help each other through this difficult, trying time, including our friends in Russia. And this is a triumph, not for the United States, but it's a triumph for human rights on both sides of the border, and nothing more than that, and make kind of a statement about it. But he chose not to uh, for good reasons. He didn't want to make it harder for Gorbachev than it already was. Ma'am. Mr. Brokaw, thank you so much for being here today. Could you identify yourself, please? My name is Mavra Aga, and I'm a 2L at the law school. Um, my question is about an exclusive interview you had with Mr. Gorbachev in 1987. And at that time, there seemed to be significant hurdles and hoops that you had to jump through to secure that interview. So my question is, how did you balance the concerns of Soviet officials as well as your broadcasting team in securing that interview? And what advice would you have as an international journalist to someone who wants to pursue international work um, in regards to working through negotiations, balancing tensions, um, and effectively achieving a goal? Well, I think if I've got it right, how does I, as a journalist, kind of understand what was going on there and, and what we were, why we were there at that time, and how did I deal with all that? And, and it, it, the other example that I've used over the years is that when 9-11 happened, I was grateful that I'd been a journalist as long as I had been, and that I knew something about the Middle East, and that I'd been a father and a citizen as long as I had been, because it took everything I knew to get through that day. And that night at the wall, it was the culmination of my lifelong interest um, in the great east-west divide. And I'd been in Russia a lot of times by then. I had not been in East Germany, obviously, by then. And, and in a way that's hard to describe, it kind of clicks in. You know, you start down a road and describing what's going on, and you have memory of other events that have happened. And, um, I've always had, as a kind of guiding principle, a narrative first, and then context and try to keep it all together so that people understand not just what they're seeing on the screen, but what the ramifications are of that and where we have been and where this may lead. So it's a, it's a great test, but it's also exhilarating and exciting for journalists, especially when your competitors are not anywhere near the place. <laughs> the time, I think she wanted to know specifically, you secured the first interview with Gorbachev. Right. How were there conditions on that? Did, did you feel there uncomfortable were, with them? Yeah. If I were to do it again, I would. We would. It was a tough negotiation, and they wanted to uh, do a simultaneous translation for one hour, and um, uh, we didn't have very good translation in those days. We took a man who had been well known and doing their UN stuff, and and we had to do it simultaneously. And they didn't. This was an entirely new experience for them. One of my colleagues was a late Gordon Manning, a, a, a fabled, legendary Boston newspaper man originally. They worked at Newsweek, worked for Waller, and then worked for us. And he was our, he was our agent in all of this. And he knew the people around Gorbachev. So we got the interview, got there, and we did get a lot out of him. But looking back on it, I would have been tougher on the conditions of it. Uh, the simultaneous translation was hard to follow because he was talking and we were hearing this translation at the same time. He opened with a bromide against the United States, and we only had one hour. And I didn't want to engage him on his uh, terribly um, mistaken view of who we are. I mean, he was doing that for his Russian audience rather than for the international audience, because we only had one hour, and I had so much stuff that I wanted to get to. So those are the decisions you have to make on the fly. But it was, a, it was an interview that was extremely well received. It was a big week for me. I did that on, it was a Thanksgiving, and then the following week, we ran that on Monday night. On Wednesday night, the following week, of the same week, um, we had a live from uh, the Kennedy Center, a debate 
of all the presidential candidates who wanted to succeed Ronald Reagan, uh, Democrats and Republicans. And, we went, and I was out there kind of without a safety net doing that for two hours. And then on Friday, Dan, Peter, and I had uh, an interview with the president, Ronald Reagan, as we were, he's winding down his administration. And we drew for first and last question, and I got both. And that was the week that God was looking down on me in some way. So that was a pretty <laughs> good week. Do, do we have a question up there at that yeah. microphone? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Brendan Kent. I'm a freshman at the college and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Uh, my question is, is going into that press conference the night the wall came down, what were you expecting? I know you, you probably obviously knew about all the events that were going on in Leipzig and everything that was happening. Were you expecting an announcement on the magnitude that, that, uh, that you got? Or were you, was it a major surprise? Was I expecting an announcement that day about the wall coming down? Yeah. No. When we were in the news conference, it was mostly a bookkeeping kind of an arrangement. They were just dealing with the trivia and minutia of what the policies were going to be. And it was not until the very end of the news conference that he pulled out the slip of paper that someone had handed to him on the way in. And a couple of people who are now, there's a dispute between two wire service and one newspaper guy about who asked the question, is the wall down? And, uh, and that's when you could almost see the panic in his eyes as he tried to avoid that as much as possible and said, comrades, it's 6 o'clock, it's time to leave. And he went upstairs. <laughs> and uh, gratefully, I had the interview uh, arranged to Michelle, so I was able to deal with him. But it was not a declaration written out in bold print. It was a confusing moment for everyone. I remember the uh, man sitting next to me was the AP bureau chief in Berlin. He'd fallen asleep by that point, and I was close <laughs> to it. And my cameraman uh, was a German national. And he immediately said to me, Tom, this means the wall is down. What he is, that means what because he'd heard it in German, and we had the translation. And, uh, you know, it was as if this thing had arrived from Mars, uh, this alien voice saying that the wall is down. And uh, whatever fatigue I felt went away very quickly. It was a very exciting moment. Um, and we kept thinking, there's got to be a catch here. But there wasn't. And one, once those events take off, they really take off. One of the reasons I really wanted to interview Tom Rocco was that the, there were uh, two times you guessed right. One was to be in Berlin at all, and the other was that you were the only, uh, the only reporter to have an exclusive interview set up with Gunter Schabowski, the man who announced the opening of the wall. You see here the image I have up is that press conference. And that press conference it was an hour press conference, and for 53 minutes, everyone who was there, yourself included, said it was excruciatingly boring. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you, you said you fell asleep at one point yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, everybody was nodding off at some point. The, inter the other interesting thing about the press conference, a, a, a small point, was that the East German press, as it, were, as it was constituted, they were more aggressive than we'd ever heard them. They were really going after them early in the press conference about details of stuff. And so that was part of the climate of the time, that the East Germans had been emboldened. And again, it was generational. These were all young reporters who were pressing him very hard. You know, he was a bureaucrat. He was a, uh, probably a third-rate uh, guy who'd risen to power because the, the leading ranks of the, of the GDR Politburo had been pretty well uh, eviscerated by, by that point. I went back to see him a year later. He was a uh, kind of a broken man. Uh, he, he didn't go to jail, as I remember. He, he was convicted, but he yeah, had basically house yeah, arrest. Yeah, and he didn't have a pension. He, his son was taking care of him. That's what most of those communist officials were worried about, that they were going to lose any ability to live out their lives financially. He had a tiny apartment in, um, in the East, and uh, he'd been living. He'd had cars and drivers and living in the compound, and suddenly he was reduced to this. And he said to me in this most pointed way, we thought that they would want to come back and resume their lives. I mean, that's how distorted their thinking was. So, so that night, he actually evades questions. He, he's supposed to announce a fairly minor change. Uh, it's not supposed to be the opening of the wall, but he botches the announcement. He doesn't bother to read it in advance. And then he uses the fact that he has to get to your interview as an excuse to get out of the room. So when people start asking questions, he says, at 7 o'clock, I've got to go, I've got to go. And he goes off to the exclusive interview with you. And all the German journalists in the room are suddenly thinking, how did he get this exclusive interview? His producer had to physically blockade the door for the duration of the interview because people were trying to bust in on it. And so you were the only one who had a chance to ask him these questions. And you, we just played the clip for you, how you responded. Well, it's, it's a permission of leaving GDR, which is East Germany. And it's kind of vague, but it, it sounds like you know, the wall is open. 
So it was a very dramatic night, and there's an interaction between the politics of the event and the coverage of it. And the uh, coverage of it, the fact people like yourself then say the wall is open, actually inspires East Europeans to go to the wall and make the wall open. So it's this amazing sense of the media getting out ahead of history, but then actually making history as well. And for the young journalists in the room, the last thought that went through my mind before I said good evening, don't screw this up, Brokaw. It's going to be around a long time. <laughs> All right, let's go to this mic over here. Hi, my name is Casey Gallagher-Schmitz. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, so I was born after uh, the, reunion, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany. So kind of a divided Germany is kind of such a foreign concept to me that I, was, I wanted to ask, is, is there still a marked difference between the Eastern sections of Germany and the Western, and are there still a lot of old wounds that need to be healed? Yeah, the, there really is. There's a, the West Germans, uh, if you probe, kind of resent having to uh, subsidize the East. There was no uh, uh, free market tradition there whatsoever, so the job training was terrible. People are not equipped to deal with the modern economy in a lot of ways. A lot of the villages uh, have None of the services that you should take for granted. One of the uh, uh, enterprising new businesses in the East, for example, was a man who has developed a mobile grocery store in which he goes from village to village and, and effectively becomes a rolling grocery store because they don't have them in the East. And uh, it's not like the American South in a way because it's not as, obviously, the color line is a wholly different <coughs> kind of uh, discrimination. But there is a feeling that it's time for these people to step up on the East. And it's, uh, there's no vibrancy in the East like there is in the West. And that's something that over the long curve that they're gonna have to deal with at some point. Um, but you think about the last 120 years of the German culture and the, German, and the country, World War I, World War II, Adolf Hitler, the Holocaust, and then the takeover, uh, one half of the country by the Soviet Union. Uh, when you go to Berlin now, you were born after it. Uh, the people of your generation and age have a renewed interest in what happened in the wall because they can't believe their parents lived like that. So whatever uh, memorials there are, or whatever uh, sites there are that are dedicated to the wall, they're jammed with school kids and with young college kids. 25 years later, you know, 21 year olds say, what do you mean? You lived on the other side of the wall and you didn't, couldn't visit your uncle or your aunt and you, lived, you didn't have anything? Um, so it, it, it really is an astonishing lesson in how rapidly history changes and changes perceptions about what people are. And the, for the German people to make the kind of recovery that they have is pretty amazing as well. Ma'am. Hello, uh, Eva Bitteker. I grew up in East Berlin, uh, about 500 meters away. Can you speak up a little bit? <laughs> I grew up in East Berlin, about 500 meters away from the wall. Um, my street that ended into the wall, and I was asleep the night of November 9th. Um, I remember waking up to my father bolting into the room in the morning and saying, kids, the wall was open last night, and we missed it. <laughs> <laughs> because the word on the street was, it's all over, it's closed again. How so old were you at that point? I was in high school. And um, my question to you was kind of a follow-up to what the gentleman asked earlier, when you came to Berlin, what were you expecting to report? Because I remember watching the newscast and we dismissed it as propaganda. It was just another one in a string of announcements. The, the pre this the press conference, you watched This it. press conference, And right. you thought it was- You, you watched Zabowski's press conference. <clears throat> Correct. And uh, we dismissed what? it as, as propaganda, just another announcement that didn't mean anything. And many people like us, not everybody, the pictures now make it seem like everybody raced to the wall and wanted to get across, but that's not everybody. Most people did dismiss it and didn't think anything was gonna well, happen. Well, what I was expecting when we first arrived was gonna be an interesting story, and it was a step and a long process, is what I thought we were doing. And I wouldn't have gone if there had been something really big and newsworthy going on here, probably. Uh, but you also must remember the conditions of 1989. This was happening all across the Eastern Bloc. Uh, these countries you know, were percolating in a way, and there was all this ferment of, of revolution and, and a demand for the human rights. Um, I absolutely understand uh, uh, how you would have felt that that was just another propaganda announcement. Wh what, did, how, what did your father do in the East? He was an engineer for what now would be telecom. 
Have we you had we had family in West Germany. My mother's mm -hmm. father was, and and aunts and uncles were in West Germany, th which I never knew. I mean, we knew I knew that we had them, but I never got to know them. So after you woke up and realized that the wall was down, did the family go across? No, we went to school. My parents went to work because it was going to be closed again. And then only slowly did we hear the news. And I think Saturday they were starting to bring cranes to our street and taking pieces of the wall out and opening more crossings because they couldn't handle the flow of people. That's when we went across. And I remember going across and being on the other side and looking at a map and trying to get an orientation of where in the world we are. We had no idea that the street continued. <laughs> <laughs> And when you look back on it now, does it seem in a way surreal or um, just another event that at that point you thought was a piece of propaganda? Very surreal, amazing how quickly things started snowballing uh, from that night. And what I loved about your conversation this evening is that you kind of set it in context, which is often not given, of all the stuff that was going on. In, 98, and I also remember uh, that, you know, we were teenagers, my parents were very protective when we wanted to go to demonstrations. They didn't want us to go because there was that undercurrent, that fear that something was going to happen, and, and the same, once the wall opened, nobody knew that it was going to stay peaceful. Did you have any sense of what the West was like, and what West Berlin was like, before you walked across, and what did you think when you saw all those broad boulevards and uh, new cars and the shops filled with all the consumer goods. We were privileged in East Berlin. We could watch West German television, which was different in other parts of East Germany where the signal was mm -hmm. scrambled. So I knew what to expect from TV. And I was more amazed by the welcoming of the West Berliners to all the East Berliners there, you know, they were handing out coffee and flowers and, and, and I don't know, cookies for everybody going across. And that's what I remember more so than the stores and the glitz. I guess it, it, it probably felt a little bit like when people now come to visit me here and we take them to New York and we go to Times Square and it's just, you know, big buildings and lots of lights. I, that's. I do remember that part, too. Well, for the rest of your life, you're going to be a player in one of the great dramatic moments of all time, and now here you are at Harvard. So you've had a complete 20th and 21st century life already. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And now, on top of all the experiences you've had, you've just been interviewed by Tom Brokaw. <laughs> I'm interviewing you here tonight. None of that, none of that, none of that. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> That's uh, it's a, you know, it's built in. It's a genetic flaw. <laughs> Talk to my grandchildren. Tom, you don't have to interview me every day, you know. <laughs> Hello, it's hard to go after that, but at least I'm also German. I'm Friederike von Reden. I'm an MPA candidate here at the Harvard Kennedy School and a McCloy Fellow. Born in West Germany when the wall was still standing, having lived in East Berlin the past eight years. I'd very much like to hear your opinion about the reunification process uh, mentally, how well you think it went. Um, you were talking about it econom economically before, um, and the re so it would be interesting to hear your opinion about the reunification process itself. Did you estimate it when you saw that the wall was coming down, and also nowadays, if you have an opinion on that? Uh, she's asking your opinion of how reunification has actually proceeded. Yeah, it, it, you know, it was, it was stop and go, frankly, unification was. Um, Margaret Thatcher was uh, vigorously opposed to it, and, and they had to take over the whole East. It was a very expensive proposition. There was a lot of transfer of funds. The Germans got a lot of help from us in that. There was some question about what would be the future of NATO, for example, and the part of East Germany in that. At one point, there was a proposal to put NATO troops in East Germany. Uh, as a kind of buffer between the West and the East. Um, Cole turned out to be the right man for the job. He was a uh, big free market guy, conservative, and he had a big vision about a unified Germany. I think that that was very important, and he, he saw it through. But as I said earlier, it's, a, it's still a process that is in the works. There was a man by the name of Guillaume who was a, a GDR agent. Uh, uh, he was a spy. 
he'd made his way all the way to the inner office of Ville Brandt. And, and then he'd been uncovered. And I went out to see him the, two days later. He was living in Adasha, way in the east on a lake. And he was repentant. He said, this is the worst idea they've ever had. I'm a communist. The socialist way is the only way for the future. So there were those people who were resisting the idea of it as well. Um, I do think that your question gets at what is too often overlooked about the kind of miracle of Germany being A, reunited, and then B, the economic miracle of being the most powerful economic engine in, in Central Europe. And when you go there, uh, depending on what ages of the people that you talk to about what they went through during World War II and what their parents went through and, and what their hopes are for the future, there still is a lot of emotional and, and, uh, and intellectual conflict in their minds. But they want what they have now to be their future and how do they want to be remembered. And uh, sir, you will have the honor of asking the last question. I'm, I'm sorry the other people in line, our, our time is running out. Mr. Brokaw has been very, very generous with the time, with his time, especially a time when he's facing some, some health challenges, I know, so we really appreciate it. So you will have the final question and then you will have the final word. Okay. Thank you. My name is Leonard Elman. I'm a 50-year alum of Harvard College. And Mr. Brokaw, I'd like to perhaps change the topic slightly and ask it, what advice would you have for the current administration in dealing with <laughs> Mr. Putin? Um, you may remember that um, before the, uh, the last election, before uh, Obama was um, uh, reelected, he said to the president of Russia, uh, you tell Putin I'll have more freedom when I, uh, in the second term. I think he's made the president has made a couple of big mistakes. I think that Putin is an opportunist. And when he saw the president being uncertain about how to deal with Syria and the red line, I think it sent a signal to this old KGB agent, I can move in on this and, and take him on. Um, I do think as well that we have not worked hard enough in a conspicuous way to reconstitute NATO and the idea of NATO. Today, Merkel was tough on Putin. It's been a long time since anybody spoke out as she did today. And I think there has to be a unified front against him. He has the added advantage of distraction of what's going on in the Middle East with ISIS. And uh, it's our third war there in 13 years. And those events will define the Obama presidency, quite honestly. This is the last act for him in a uh, in a mega way about how we deal with that, how it's, it won't be resolved by the time he leaves office, but will we be in a position to eventually get it resolved? I don't know. But I think Putin is taking all this in and making his decision about those two areas, Ukraine and Crimea, where he rightly calculates that it's not much interest to the West, which is consumed by its economic difficulties at the moment. And there's a fatigue in this country about getting involved in other places. He's a very canny guy. And he has, I think he's very corrupt as well, the kleptocracy of, of Russia with his oligarchs around him control all the banks and all the oil and everything else. But he's going to use it to the max. And I don't know at this point about how you catch up to that. At the G20 meeting, he was so scorned that he, he was not happy about any left. But he'll, he'll, in my judgment, will revert to his old ways very quickly. He is who he is. He's a Russian nationalist. He's a former KGB agent. Uh, the fact that this man, who was just a driver for Sobchak in, in St. Petersburg, who would meet all the Americans when they came there, rose to the power that he has today is, uh, is a commentary on his kind of Darwinistic idea of how he's going to run the country. You know, the power will gravitate to the top, and I want to be there and running it. So that's what I think. I think it's a, I think it's a very tough issue, but you've got to mobilize the West and others as well to say this shall not stand. We're, we should not have a military confrontation with them in Ukraine, but there are other ways of, of dealing with that. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time. I'd also like to say thank you to the forum for hosting this event and to the Belfer Center, uh, Graham Allison, and to the Center for European Studies, Elaine Papoulias, uh, for helping to make this possible. And mostly, thank you to you. Well, I want to just say one thing, if I can, to a Harvard audience, which I always do. I've, I love coming to this institution. I've been coming for years to this forum, 
the Kennedy School where I did the Teddy White lecture. I did Class Day commencement in 1999, I think. And when I was a young man growing up in a working class family in South Dakota, for geographic distribution reasons, I was recruited by Harvard uh, with five other of my friends from South Dakota. And Harvard, in its infinite wisdom, decided that I was not quite worthy of admission. And so I have been able to say throughout my life, I wondered what success I might have made if I'd only gone to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have, you have come to Harvard, and we are very grateful. And we're also very grateful to all of you for coming tonight to help mark the 25th anniversary of the Fall of the Wall. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very much.